Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with you this afternoon. As you all may have noticed from my bio, I spent most of my professional life in Dallas, Texas. And just about three and a half months ago, I moved to Florida. I live in Boca Raton. And I have to say, I can understand now why everybody wants to live in Florida. So thank you for uh, welcoming me here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a topic that I think is very important, which is sleep disorders and fatigue in Parkinson's. Uh, really, the beginning of the story begins here in 1817. Uh, you all are familiar with the fact that the disease we're studying is named after a famous British physician named James Parkinson. And you'll notice that even in his original essay that was published in 1817, he was aware of the sleep problems associated with Parkinson's. He noted that in this stage, talking about the more advanced stages of Parkinson's, the sleep becomes much disturbed, the tremulous motion of the limbs occur during sleep and augment until they awaken the patient and frequently with much agitation and alarm. So my point here is simply that we've known about sleep problems from the beginning, but it's really only been more recently that some serious energy has been put into studying it and trying to find ways uh, to deal with it. Uh, what I'm going to do, I've broken my talk down into two halves. The first half is going to be to talk about the sleep problems in Parkinson's disease. And then a little bit later, towards the end of my talk, I'm going to focus more specifically on the subject of fatigue. And as I hope to persuade you, sleep problems and fatigue are actually two different problems, although there are some interconnected features of the two. So we're going to begin with a discussion of sleep problems in PD. What are the common problems that patients with Parkinson's disease encounter regarding sleep? And they're listed on the slide. Uh, first one we're going to discuss is insomnia. That's just what it sounds like. It's inability to sleep well at night. We're going to talk about REM sleep behavior disorder next, which is a very interesting problem that is very common in Parkinson's. It's not universal, so if you have Parkinson's, you may never have experienced it, but it's a common problem that I see in the clinic. We'll talk a little bit about restless leg syndrome because restless leg syndrome can interact with that first problem called insomnia and prevent you from getting to sleep at night. Uh, there's another uh, interesting subject uh, called sleep attacks that are just what they sound like. It's when patients suddenly fall asleep without warning, and those are kind of scary. I'll show you a little bit of data on that and what our current understanding of that disorder is. And then we'll talk about daytime sedation, that is just feeling sleepy during the daytime. Each of these we're gonna discuss in turn. Let me start with insomnia. Uh, this is probably the most common sleep problem that we see in the field of Parkinson's disease. Uh, you can see there that studies have shown that some 30 to 80 percent of patients with Parkinson's at some point in the illness will complain of insomnia. Now there are three major types of insomnia and when you're talking with your neurologist about this you need to really be sure that it comes out which of these are the ones that you're dealing with. Uh, the first one is called initial insomnia, and that's the problem where you go to lay down in bed at night and you just can't fall asleep. It's, it's the phase of insomnia where you can't start sleeping. The second phase is called maintenance insomnia. That's where you fall asleep, no problem, but then you start waking up frequently during the night such that you wake up the next morning and you don't feel refreshed because you had multiple awakenings during the night. And then the final type is called terminal insomnia, and that's when you wake up in the early a.m. hours and you can't get back to sleep, period. You're, you're, you're done sleeping at 3 a.m., which can be very inconvenient for your family and for the activities that you need to do during the day. So we'll talk briefly about each of these forms of insomnia. Uh, the first of them, initial insomnia, um, we think that the major causes of this include poor motor function at bedtime, depression, anxiety, and poor sleep hygiene. 
those four factors are the big ones that are connected to initial insomnia. Now, what do I mean by poor motor function at bedtime? Well, Dr. Hauser talked to you extensively about the concept of off time and on time. And as you can imagine, if you have an off state at about the time that you're supposed to be going to bed, you're gonna have serious problems falling asleep because you're gonna be tremoring, you're gonna be slow, you're gonna be stiff, and you're gonna have trouble rolling over in bed and finding a comfortable spot. And so that in and of itself will prevent you from falling asleep. Uh, one of the treatments for that, uh, Dr. Uh, Hauser pointed out, is Gocovery. Another one that I found very useful is a newer version of Carbidopa levodopa called Carbidopa levodopa extended release capsules. Goes by the trade name Ritari. What that does is it produces a, a more even saturation of dopaminergic stimulation during the day and thereby reduces the risk that you'll be in poor motor function when it's time for bed. Depression and anxiety, you heard about in an earlier talk this morning, very common in Parkinson's disease, and those should be independently addressed. The good news is we have good treatments for both of them, and so if you're feeling sad or if you're feeling anxious, invariably that will interrupt your sleep. Be sure you mention that to your neurologist so he can get on the right treatment for that. And then finally, there's this problem called poor sleep hygiene. And this is a major problem, but I'm gonna leave you hanging for a minute on defining what that is and how to fix it. The next kind of insomnia is called maintenance insomnia. And again, this is the problem where you wake up frequently during the night. I like the term sleep fragmentation because I think that really summarizes what we're talking about. In effect, you sleep, but you sleep in short fragments that are interrupted by awakenings. And it can be extremely uh, disabling to patients to constantly have to wake up in the middle of the night. In fact, in my patients that I treat, this is the most common sleep disorder that we hear about. Now, there are several causes, as you can see on your slides there. Uh, one of them is something called nocturia. And that's just a fancy term that means you have to, to wake up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. It turns out there are a series of significant uh, urinary problems that keep company with Parkinson's disease. And uh, essentially what we think happens is when you try to urinate, your, your muscle surrounding the bladder squeezes to expel the urine. But unfortunately, frequently in Parkinson's disease, at the same time your bladder is trying to expel urine, the sphincter of the bladder is tightening. And so you can't get the, the, the urine out of your bladder completely. And so you don't fully empty your bladder. And therefore, if the bladder is not fully emptied, guess what? It fills up much quicker and it requires you to get up and go to the bathroom frequently at night. The reason I explain all that to you is that's treatable. Now you need a different kind of doctor for that. You need a urologist with a U to treat that. And so ask your neurologist if this is the problem, and if it is, they can refer you to a good urologist for the treatment of those bladder problems that can affect you during the nighttime. Uh, motor fluctuations are another key uh, problem here. Essentially, if you're in an on state when you go to bed, you'll be able to fall asleep, but then if that dose of medication wears off in the middle of the night, guess what? Your tremor is gonna come back, your stiffness is gonna come back, and you're gonna wake up again. So here again, strategies that reduce off time. Gocovery is one, uh, there are multiple other drugs, Ritari is another. Your, your neurologist will be familiar with all the tools that we have to reduce off time, and in doing so, we can reduce that fragmentation of your sleep. And then unfortunately, there's also an element of the progression of Parkinson's disease itself. And that's what James Parkinson was talking about because of course at the time he wrote his essay, there were no known treatments for Parkinson's disease. And what he observed was that the more advanced the patient was, the more likely they would have sleep disorders. And for the progression, of course, there's not much we can do. But the bottom line is, if you have maintenance insomnia, you're waking up frequently at night, be sure to consult with your urologist if it's a urinary problem 
Talk to your neurologist about switching around or adjusting your PD meds to avoid a nocturnal off state and always follow the rules of sleep hygiene. And then finally, terminal insomnia is that one where you wake up early in the AM and can't be get back to sleep. This is the most poorly understood of all the types of insomnia in Parkinson's. We suspect it may be in part due to excessive daytime sleep. Uh, raise your hand if you have Parkinson's and you take naps during the afternoon. So I see a number of hands up. Uh, naps are, are, are commonly employed by our Parkinson patients to deal with sleepiness during the daytime. Uh, but believe it or not, that's a problem. Your naps are probably hurting you, and we're going to talk about that more in just a moment. So what are the rules for sleep hygiene? What do I mean by this, and how do we employ it? This is the first step for treating all forms of insomnia. I don't care if you have initial, maintenance, or terminal insomnia. You need to focus on these rules for sleep hygiene. The concept of sleep hygiene is simply this. Every individual has a certain amount of sleep that their body needs for optimal health. And what you have to do is prepare your body for the sleep that you need and make sure it occurs at night. You don't want to be getting the sleep that you need in the middle of the daytime, or guess what? You've just stolen sleep time that you might otherwise be able to spend at night when everybody else is sleeping and when the world is shut down. So here are the rules for sleep hygiene that come from the Sleep Foundation. I'm just going to briefly mention these. You can read them. Number one, you need a good sleep schedule. And what I mean by that is, to the extent possible, you ought to have relatively fixed wake up and going to bed times. Don't have a high degree of variability on when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed at night. You really need to minimize daytime naps. And I, I am constantly working with my patients to avoid napping, both intentional naps and unintentional naps. What's an unintentional nap? That's when you're watching TV uh, in the evening after supper and you fall asleep. That's one of the worst types of naps to take because then when two hours later you go lay down in bed at night, there's no way you're going to fall asleep because you've already taken the edge off of that need for sleep. It's very important to have a nightly sleep routine. What do I mean by that? You want to start dimming the lights. You want to stop using your iPhone, your iPad, and your other electronics. You need to really go into a wind-down phase and relax before bed at night. It's just as important to develop a healthy daylight schedule. And one of the most important parts of this is first thing in the morning, you need to get uh, exposure to bright lights. I have a number of patients who use blackout curtains in their, in their bedrooms so that they don't get any light into their room. That's very bad. You need to get rid of the blackout curtains and when the sun comes up and the light starts to stream in, it stimulates a center in the brain that produces wakefulness. So by having the dark curtains, you're preventing yourself from benefiting from that wakefulness event. So get some bright light in the morning, get exercise, try not to eat a late dinner because that can compromise your ability to fall asleep. And then finally, you wanna spend a few minutes thinking about your bedroom. Has your bedroom been optimized to promote sleep? For example, do you have a comfortable bed, or when you lay down on that bed, do you immediately start tossing and turning because you're uncomfortable? You got to get rid of that old mattress, invest in a good new mattress that you're comfortable in. You also need to eliminate noise to the best of your ability, because noise will prevent you from falling to sleep or can wake you up in the middle of the night. And then for the nighttime period, you want to block out light. So if you live in an apartment and you overlook a busy street with a street light, that's when you need your blackout curtains. But then first thing in the morning when you're ready to start your day, open those curtains up, let the light come shining in. And just following these simple rules will help you with all three forms of, inco of insomnia. And it's the first and most important step for treating it. 
Now, if all of that fails and you've done the best you can do, there are some medications that we do recommend uh, for patients with really severe insomnia. Uh, the first drug that we typically use will be melatonin. Uh, what's great about it is it's available over the counter. I recommend five to 10 milligrams as a single dose at bedtime. And the beauty of melatonin is it's a natural agent. So melatonin exists in nature and all we're doing is we're giving you a higher dose of an otherwise naturally occurring substance which activates the sleep center and helps to put you to sleep. When that drug doesn't work, as a second line, there are a couple of uh, sedating antidepressants that I like. I've listed in there, trazodone and doxepin. The reason those are my go-to drugs is they're not addictive, they cause a minimal hangover effect the next morning, and they allow you to be, have a restorative type of sleep that makes you feel refreshed. And the other thing that's great about them, you heard me say earlier that depression is one of the causes of insomnia. So there may be some undiagnosed depression going on that's contributing to your insomnia, in which case an antidepressant drug is, is a nice helper with the problem we're dealing with. The drugs I do not recommend are Benadryl, which is a sedating antihistamine. It's the active ingredient in Tylenol PM and a number of other drugs you can get over the counter because all drugs in that class have now been linked to an increased risk of memory impairment down the road. And as you may know, Parkinson's disease is a risk factor for memory impairment anyway, even without the help of drugs like this. And then I don't like basically any drug that you've seen advertised on TV for sleep because all of those drugs generally have an addictive property and they do not produce a restorative type of sleep, which is what we're looking to achieve. Now the next topic on our sleep disorders list is called REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, REM, by the way, stands for rapid eye movement. So as you may know, there are multiple different stages of sleep that the body goes through uh, during the night. The REM sleep, it does not occupy a very large percentage of your sleep, but it's a critically important type of sleep during which you have vivid dreams. And in the normal human brain, there's a special pathway that paralyzes all of your skeletal muscles except for your heart and your diaphragm during that period. So when you're dreaming and jumping off buildings and fighting with people and skiing and riding your boat and doing all of these other activities in your dream life, your body lies very still in bed. That's the way it's supposed to work. Well, unfortunately, in Parkinson's disease, that pathway degenerates. Not in all patients, but in many patients. And the result is they start acting out their dreams. And in some patients, that acting out can be very violent. You can hit, you can punch your bed partner, uh, you can even fall out of bed and injure yourself. Um, and so we don't want that to occur. And if this is a problem that you have, please talk to your neurologist about it because it is imminently treatable. This is one of those problems in Parkinson's disease that has a relatively easy fix if we hear about it and the patient uh, lets us know. Incidentally, one of the major uh, reasons that we want to treat this is because if we don't treat it, eventually your bed partner, if you have one, is going to leave the room because they don't want to get beat up every night uh, as a result of your activity. And we don't want that. I want your bed partner to be able to stay in bed with you, and that's why it's important to treat it, even though you as the patient may not know it because, again, you're asleep when this is happening. You can see the treatment options there. Again, we start with melatonin. It does work in many patients. When that's insufficient, we up the dose and we give a drug called clonazepam that is extremely helpful at reducing REM sleep behavior disorder. So please, if this is something you have, make a note of it and discuss it with your physician. Now, restless leg syndrome is the next one. Uh, RLS, as you may know, is a uncontrollable desire to move your legs. And it tends to occur very inconveniently when you lay down in bed at night. So you're laying down in bed and then immediately your legs start to bother you and you have to kick them and thrash them around to relieve that feeling. Obviously, if you have that, you're gonna have insomnia as a result. 
It is much more common in Parkinson's than it is in the general population, and uh, there is a treatment for this one. Uh, the best treatment I find is to use, once again, one of these long-acting levodopa preparations because levodopa is an excellent drug for controlling it, and if you're wearing off and your levodopa levels are dropping, that's when your RLS will occur if you have this problem. Uh, there are a couple of other FDA-approved drugs for RLS. They fall into the category of the dopamine agonist. They're okay to try, but there are a number of adverse effects that result from dopamine agonist, which is why that's not my first-line drug. And then gabapentin is the other drug that your doctor will know about. When used appropriately, can help a lot with restless leg syndrome. Now, this is a slide talking about sleep attacks. Uh, this video is not of a Parkinson patient who had a wreck, I'm happy to say, but this can happen and does happen if in, in rare cases where patients are doing something potentially dangerous, whether it be driving or operating heavy machinery, and they fall asleep suddenly. Uh, this was first reported in the summer of 1999, and it generated a tremendous uh, media buzz, as you can see there. And it was linked pretty closely to a couple of drugs that were prominently being used at that time point, which were called dopamine agonists. Uh, what we now believe about these sleep attacks is that they're actually very rare. So I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that if you have Parkinson's disease, you're likely to experience this. It's quite uncommon for this to occur. But what does happen fairly frequently is patients, when driving, start to feel sleepy. And if you start to feel sleepy when you're driving and you ignore that feeling, then you may really fall asleep and wind up having an accident. But for the vast majority of patients, there's a feeling of sleepiness that occurs before you actually fall asleep. And so what I'm asking you to do is be reasonable, and if you start to feel sleepy while you're driving or doing anything other dangerous, you need to pull over the vehicle and rest. Don't think you can fight it, because as a Parkinson patient, you have a reduced ability to fight that sleepiness and may very well fall asleep while you're driving. I mentioned this before, but it's important to remember that the dopamine agonist class of drugs have, have a particular relationship to this problem. You can get it from levodopa, but it's more commonly seen in the dopamine agonist because those drugs cause more sedation than levodopa does. And again, we think it's that sleepiness that you get during the day that is the cause of this. We're gonna talk about it in a few minutes. Please, if you've ever actually experienced a sleep attack, you've gotta to talk to your neurologist about it because there may be some treatments that would Im improve that scenario. And above all, if you have ever had a sleep attack, and if it's a recurrent problem, you really do need to stop driving. That will protect you and it will protect the driving public. Now the final topic on the issue of sleep disorders is daytime sleepiness. This is extremely common in Parkinson's disease. In fact, in one study that we did, 55% of all Parkinson patients have excessive sleepiness. So this is a huge issue, and as you can imagine, it ties in a little bit with insomnia. If you're not sleeping well at night, you're obviously much more likely to be sleepy during the daytime. Unfortunately, this is not often discussed in office visits, and it should be because, as I will show you, there's some very important treatments that can be employed for this. Uh, what are the causes of daytime sleepiness? Well, unfortunately, the duration of Parkinson's and the severity of Parkinson's are causes. Obviously, you can't do anything about that. But it's also true that the total daily dose of dopaminergic drugs that you're taking, if you combine all the different drugs that you take for Parkinson's, the higher those doses are, the more likely this is to happen, as well as the use of a dopamine agonist at any dose. So in part, because of this risk, I have begun to de-emphasize the use of dopamine agonists in my practice. What do we mean by dopamine agonists? I've given you the list of drugs there. Pramipexol, ropinirole, and ritigotine are the drugs that 
potentially place you at higher risk for this. So what's the treatment? Unfortunately, we can't do anything about disease duration or severity, but what we can do is use the lowest dose of dopaminergic drugs that you need, never take more than you need, ask your neurologist whether or not you should consider coming off a dopamine agonist if you're already taking one, and then there are some stimulant medications that we have used successfully when we really get into trouble with this, uh, and the two are modafinil and armodafinil. So I prefer those drugs to the amphetamine-like products because amphetamine, at least in animal models, can actually accelerate the progression of the neural damage that is characteristic of Parkinson's. Well, finally, in the last few minutes, I want to talk to you about fatigue in Parkinson's disease. Very interesting subject. It turns out fatigue is not the same thing as sleepiness. These are different problems, and you can see the definition there. It's significantly diminished energy levels or the increased perception of effort required to do something that is disproportionate to the need for the actual task. These are some of the symptoms, just to give you a thumbnail sketch. Uh, they can be caused just by normal activities. You don't have to do something super strenuous to feel fatigue. They can occur with little or no exertion whatsoever. In fact, the, this may be such a big problem that you may be, develop a fear of doing any kind of activity. You may become a couch potato because you're afraid that if you get up and you go for a walk or you go to the store, that you'll be so fatigued that you won't be able to go on. So fatigue is a big problem and it's something that needs to be addressed. The other key feature of fatigue is that it can result in significant distress and social impairment. Uh, when I see a patient who has bad fatigue and Parkinson's disease, it really affects their life. It affects their relationship to their spouse, their children, other friends because their tendency is to not want to go do anything for fear of worsening the fatigue and reaching a point where they literally can't go on. We have now believe that fatigue as a specific problem affects up to 50 percent of patients with Parkinson's disease. So again, it's, there's, there's a coin toss on whether you're going to have this. We now know that it clearly diminishes the quality of life and it feeds into depression. Unfortunately, we have not been able to discover the specific cause of this. Uh, we don't necessarily think that it has anything to do with the medicines that we're using for Parkinson's, and I don't know of any specific medicines that will fix fatigue. And most amazingly, it can affect you at any stage of the disease. It can affect an early stage, untreated patients who've just been diagnosed with Parkinson's, oftentimes complain of fatigue, or it can be an accompaniment of more advanced Parkinson's disease in patients who are on medications. So we need a lot more research into this area in order to answer some of those key questions. We do know that fatigue is associated with older age, longer disease duration, more severe motor symptoms, cognitive impairment, apathy and depression, and daytime sleepiness. So everything you see on this slide would be a risk factor for fatigue. So if you have any of these, we need to look even more carefully and you need to be more alert to the onset or the development of this problem. Treatment of fatigue, very, very challenging. Uh, as you can see there, there have been a couple of very small studies that have suggested benefit from a drug uh, for Parkinson's called resagiline. Uh, there have been a few very small studies looking at stimulants to see if those might help uh, the feeling of fatigue. Even acupuncture has been tried. In, in all of these three studies, there was a slight improvement in the active study group compared to the placebo group. But the big problem with these studies is that there was an enormous improvement in the placebo group as well. And therefore, proving that the drug really helped you is challenging and it's to the point where I don't actually recommend any of those things for fatigue. What we all think is the most effective treatment, believe it or not, is exercise. Now that is totally counterintuitive. 
You would think that if you're feeling fatigue, what you need to do is go sit on the couch and rest. And that's what you want to do. But just the opposite is the treatment for it. If you'll get out of the couch and go start getting active, you will find that your fatigue is less and less and less over time. And so the patients that do the best with Parkinson's disease over the long runs are the ones who develop a robust exercise program. You know, at least three times a week, you're doing a formal exercise. And on the other days, you're just doing an active lifestyle. You're not sitting around watching TV, you're getting up, you're doing stuff, you're going to the mall, you're going for a walk. If you live in Florida, there's so many beautiful things to do outdoors. You need to do that, and what you'll find is your fatigue will gradually improve. So to summarize then, I think sleep disorders and fatigue are both common problems in Parkinson's disease, and the key here is detection of these problems and talking about them with your doctor. Dr. Hauser mentioned that when you go to the doctor, generally you only have time to cover one or two things. And so be sure that this is one of those one or two things at at least one visit every now and then so that you can get the appropriate treatment. Uh, we know that both problems impact quality of life. Many of them are treatable. And so the key is to bring them up at an office visit, talk to your neurologist about it, and see what we can do to help you. Thank you very much for your attention.